Thank you everybody for attending our webinar this evening. This is the second in a series on how to manage the time shift and we will be offering these free webinars throughout the summer in order for people to come into the course and have a bit of understanding about the whole facet of time and space and consciousness that we're going to be addressing. So tonight we're going to talk about the psychological experience of time. And this is very important because our experience of clock time, which is essentially linear time as we were mentioning last week, and is measured in steppy step sequences like we see on a clock, that type of time no longer really works for us in trying to understand our personal experience. So tonight we're going to look at how to understand our personal experience from a little bit different perspective. So we mentioned last week that one of the reasons that we started this particular series is because I thought that it might be a very good explication of what is happening in our political and social situation at the present moment. And we said that when there is a surprise when there's something very unexpected, that before the event that is unexpected takes place, there appears to be a change in the flow of time. And I mentioned last week that when we were all looking towards the election, and especially on the election evening, that there is always that feeling of expectation and a sense that something very important is about to happen. And that sets up this experience of psychological expectation, which was very pronounced during that evening. But for a moment, I would like you to think about a personal event that you have had, something that was very important to you personally. And remember that when we think about memory, we don't only want to go to memory that in a sense we have rehearsed from the past. We call this rehearsed memory, literally. That means that there are stories that we tell ourselves about our past. Psychological experience often has very poignant, very powerful, very beautiful memories, or perhaps traumatic memories that are not rehearsed memories, and they're in a way not significant in the larger context but in our inner life, they're tremendously significant. So when we have an expectation of something happening, we feel a buildup of feeling, usually in the heart, but it can be in other parts of the body-mind complex as well. And there's a tension. You might think of it really like before a storm sometimes, you feel that tension building in the air. There's also a psychological tension when an event is about to take place. And that feeling of tension in the body alters our inner experience of time. I believe that there are actually biochemical reasons why we experience time differently before a major event. And when we operate within the context of that event, in other words, we accept the event. We take the event into our awareness. We note it. We're mindful of it. Because many events go by and we are not mindful of them. We're not awake to them. We're not aware. But when we have this profound level of awakeness towards the event and we have this buildup of feeling or tension or expectation prior to the event, this is what causes the time alteration psychologically. Now, sometimes we will experience an event, and I'm sure many of us have felt this before, and we have that experience of deja vu. We feel that the event has occurred prior to this moment, or we know that there's going to be a sequence of feeling or other details in the environment, and we have a sense that we've seen all of this before. From my point of view, 
we need to understand that the future is actually feeding information back to us in the present. And there's actually quite a bit of documentation of research about this now that we're beginning to hear from scientists. So this experience of feeling into the future is part of the feeling of expectation or possibility that we actually know and understand within ourselves. And these sequences of feeling are also interwoven with sequences of events. And so one event, the next event, the next event, the next moment, the next feeling, there's a train of feeling that is generated. And that train of feeling can either feel like it's going more slowly, or it can feel like it is being speeded up. I think most of us would probably recognize that in the past few months, we've experienced a speeding up of time. Just keeping up with the news, keeping up with all the levels of the news, news about the climate, news about political situations, news about unfortunate traumatic events. It feels like, in a sense, we've gotten on a roller coaster and we're just riding over the waves of event after event in a very, very pronounced, powerful, and sometimes jarring way. And this is because there are certain types of events that we can fully understand before they occur. We have that premonition, we have that sensibility, we have that sense of wonder, as we were saying, and we have a predictability to those events. But sometimes, when time is going so quickly, and also time is being compressed, which we're also going to talk about in a moment, we, we actually don't have a sense of predictability. We don't know what's going to come next. And there's a feeling sometimes of trepidation or fear or an elevated sense of surprise because we're not sure how we're going to take what is happening to us. So the experience of time, because the actual time field is non-variable in this way, the, the actual time field is very calm and it's very stable, and it's very solid. And that transcendental value underneath the experience of sequences of events moving very quickly or psychological experiences moving very quickly, that stable value underneath the changing value, you have an interaction between the two of them. So the notion of a time shift involves these changing values psychologically, the changing values in the environment, and the interaction between that very quiet, stable level. In a sense, the two interact and they set up a somewhat conflictual relationship with each other. And in my work, this is called a time break. There's actually a pause, a break, and that break can be very sudden. It can feel a little bit shocking, or it might just simply be a gentler experience of a pause. Because that inner quiet level is pulling up underneath the level of action, of feeling and events. And then there is a suspension. Now, what do I mean by a suspension? When you're walking down the street, and let's say you're in Manhattan, and you're observing all of the different kinds of people and the sounds and the smells, and you also have your inner experience. So you're having feelings, perhaps you're having memories, perhaps you're anticipating things that might be going on for you that day, perhaps you're planning. So you have all this activity going on in the temporal field. 
But then, as I said, you have that inner silence and that inner stability of that deep, actual, non-referential temporal experience going on underneath. So when that bleeds through, even on the subway, even in traffic, even when there's a lot of noise, or there's a lot of noise in the mind, there will be a break, there will be a pause, there will be an opening. And once that break occurs, and because everything is bleeding up from deep within that silent value, there will be a suspension of time. It could just be for a moment, but it could actually feel for a moment like everything has frozen. I'm using the analogy of the subway because I'm, I grew up in the New York area. And when you go into the subway, sometimes when you have that much activity and that much noise, and at the same time you have that much silence connecting with that, there are often experiences where you feel that everything has stopped. There's kind of a suspended value. Things are hanging in the air. So that feeling of suspension accompanies action. And the experience of a time break accompanies that value of many, 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 many event sequences rolling in on themselves, folding over themselves. So you have the pause and the rest and the suspension, and then you have the action. Think of this in music. Music is a very good example of this because in many forms of music, you have something called a drone. We especially hear this in healing music, but think about bagpipes. Think about any type of music where you hear a sound underneath and that that track, that track of sound is laid down underneath the entire experience. And then you have musical sequences going on and then the musicians themselves are bringing their level of feeling, which are their psychological events, into the recording that they're making or into the live performance. So when you listen to music, I'm sure you've noticed that at different times, in a, in a, especially in a live concert, you'll feel yourself moving away from the field of music and into silence. And then you'll kind of be startled and come back. And then when you come back, there might be some expectation of what the next sequence of sound will be. So this is how time or the temporal field interacts or works with us. One of the things we've also noticed about time is that time can be disappointing. In other words, we want something to happen. We feel that something will happen, again, like the night of the election. So we want an expectation. We want something to come out of it that is psychologically pleasing to us and will help us or we perceive it will help us. So when there's some disappointment, when something doesn't happen that we have been anticipating and we want to see, our psychology in a sense becomes a little depleted. We feel a, a sense of disappointment and sadness perhaps. And that sense of depletion in our psychological structure will also trigger a shift in time because our psychological interaction with the temporal field will again, because we're disappointed, because there is some sadness, because there is some loss or some possibility of loss, we feel time in a sense slowing down, shrinking, collapsing on itself. And of course, the most extreme cases of this would be in a case of depression, where someone, at, we even say that they are depressed because essentially this feeling of ebullient and enthusiastic expectation that we have when we feel enthusiastic and joyous about life that can lose 
itself to this sadness, which causes time to, to wane and to be released back into that transcendent field. So there can be disappointment. And then, unfortunately, there can be something even stronger than that, which is trauma. So something happens that's actually painful to us that we were not expecting. And it comes out of nowhere. It could be a physical accident, but it could also be something that someone says to us that we find very traumatic or difficult. So at that moment, when either the physical accident hits, we perhaps we're in a little car accident, or we find that uh, something falls in front of us that we didn't expect, or there's something that is said to us that is very shocking or difficult to take in, our psychological inner state of time accommodates the trauma and it accommodates the trauma by slowing down usually because we want to be able to take in the stimulation that that situation is producing. That's why if you have ever been unfortunately in a car accident, there is that period where everything seems to be slowing down before unfortunately you are hit. I've experienced this myself very vividly. And when that slowing down happens, our psychological sense of time is shifted and we feel that we can compensate for the trauma. It's a way that our brain creates a cushion so that we will not be too shocked. We will not be too thrown out of our felt sense of reality. So our brain and central nervous system have very, very comfortable ways of buffering these kinds of temporal shifts. However, even though that buffer might be there, we still experience the shift. So when the car is hit, or your heart is hurt by something that someone is saying to you, or there's some feeling of being deeply misunderstood that actually feels traumatic to you, or there might be a medical event, you might be in surgery, or you might have to receive some medical procedure that your body-mind complex experiences as assaultive in some way, Again, your inner sense of time will slow down, create a buffer, and compensate for what is happening. And this is the beauty of being human. And it's the way that we assuage pain. One of the things to understand is that the temporal field itself has the capacity to create happiness from within itself. So even when something unhappy or even traumatic is happening, the temporal field will well up with an experience of happiness or buoyancy or resilience. And it will offer that to us if we are available for it. So sometimes in a traumatic moment, and I'm, I'm sure that many of us have experienced this, even though it might be very painful or very difficult or very surprising or very shocking, we also feel that the temporal field itself is offering some sense of comfort or solace. It creates an opening in itself so that something beautiful can occur within our heart and within our mind and within our body. So that needing of that deep inner experience of time and that beautiful expansion that the temporal fields always offer. The temporal field, I use the word in a singular fashion, but really there are more than one. So they're really temporal fields as opposed to a temporal field. And the reason that I'm saying that is because the temporal field 
finds its point of origination, as we were discussing, by projecting itself out towards the future. And this is why I was saying last week that even though most of the time when we think about spiritual practice, we think about bringing ourselves fully into a grounded present. And this is a very beautiful understanding and we can come back to it in a minute, but in this moment, we're talking about how time sequences itself by projecting itself out into the future and then folding back into the present. Now this becomes important because we come to understand that there's a force behind that projection and it's quite a strong force. In my work, I call this arcing. And this is the force that I use when I actually work with people in a remote level. We arc our attention out towards them. So in a sense, we are moving out into a possible future. And we are looking inside the, the field of another person or another animal. So when we have that experience of arcing or moving out, from our heart, from our inner experience. We make contact with a possible future. And this is one portion of the temporal field, that possible future experience. Once we make contact, immediately that information from that edge of the future will immediately transmit itself back to us and we will have a feeling. So we are doing this all day long. Even if you don't think of yourself as a planner and you tend to be the kind of personality that is more able or willing or finds it delightful to stay in the present, we're constantly sending these streamers out of attention into the future to be able to understand how we can move, how we can think, and actually how we can operate fully. So that arcing experience, that projection out into the future is a very natural part of being sentient. And when that information comes back to us, it usually comes back to us in a fairly compressed package. It's not elongated. There aren't long memory streams associated with that. The information from the future comes back towards us like a wafer. It's very compressed and, we, and our nervous system is able to assimilate these little cookies, if you will, these little wafers of future experience. We take them in and we're able to process them but we also store them. So this is why you could be eight years old and you could go way out into the future to when, let's say you're 40 years old or 50 years old, and you can have flashes of memory from the future coming back at you and you can store them in the buffer of your physiology for many, many years. And then, when you have the actual event, you will have a feeling, which we often cause, you know, we call this deja vu, where, which basically means we've already seen it. And we have because that information has been passed back to us from the future and we have stored it. And when the temporal field is able to re-identify the memory, it has that aha and we maybe for a moment or even a little bit longer than that, we know what is going to happen. This is a very common experience that many people have. And this is one portion of the wholeness of the temporal field. So it's a piece of the temporal field. You can think of this Again, if you want to use a musical analogy, that we have themes like in the overture of a symphony. 
And we hear those themes in the beginning, or when you go to a Broadway show, you often hear this. The orchestra, you'll sit down and you'll take your seat and the orchestra will play themes that will give you a little bit of a preview of what this symphony is going to be like or what the performance is going to be like. And you're taking in that information into your awareness. And again, the information is compressed and it's held in the buffer of your memory. So then when the scene arises where that music is going to be the theme, your whole physiology gets it. It recognizes it. There's a profound level of recognition. And there may actually already be some emotion attached to it because when you heard the music in the beginning, that experience of music is emanating from within you and so when it actually appears, there's a sense of aha, of recognition, and some emotional content. And this is why music in a movie is so powerful. The other thing that we see with time is that because time teaches us about the nature of itself, which is basically how time works. Time teaches us about itself. We're not teaching time. Time is teaching us. And so one of the things that time wants to express to us is that it is infinite and it's also completely finite simultaneously, which is the amazing thing about time. When you're a little child, say you're two or three years old, and you're thinking about life, say, in your 50s or 60s, which, you know, if you were able to do that as a two-year-old, you realize that as a child, time is very, very infinite. Think about moments when you're riding your bicycle, let's say, at six or seven years old, and you're out in the countryside, and you just see all the beautiful scenery and the rolling hills, and there's just this feeling of time expanding around you. And, and you're not thinking to yourself, I'm aging, <laughs> I'm getting older, time isn't going to be available to me. You're thinking the entire panor panorama of your life is completely available to you. So this is the feeling of infinity in time. At the same time, you're living with yourself right on that bicycle and you're looking at what's happening around you at that moment. So you have the finite value of time, something that we would appear to feel internally, psychologically as real to us. Then we have perhaps that sense of projection that we were originally talking about, where the future is talking back to us. And then we have this sense of infinity, where time is, goes out forever, and it's never ending, and nothing ever stops, nothing ever ceases, and we are always alive in that. So the experience of infinity in time is also very important, and this is why many spiritual teachers talk about timelessness. One of the ways that many of us have experienced timelessness is in the process of meditation because we enter into a somewhat altered state and we enter into a temporal field that is of a different character than what we experience in waking state. How is the temporal field different when we're meditating? The temporal field, when we are meditating, has more light. It has more luminosity. In a sense, it's more lucid. And, and one of the reasons that the temporal field is more lucid is because all the psychological event structures that are going on internally slow down in meditation. And even if they speed up because of the release of stress, because of some trauma that we've experienced, there's still a slowing down that goes on. 
And in that slowness that takes place, there's an elongation of time. There's a psychological experience that time is elongating, stretching, expanding. And when we are in meditation and something from deep, deep, deep in the physiology interrupts that elongation, whatever that interruption may be, it could be a noise it could from outside, or it could be some sensation on the inside. Again, our whole being will experience a break in time. And we also may experience what we talked about originally, which is a suspension in time. It's like we're sitting on a hammock suspended in time. So this combination of suspension and the experience of infinity and the experience of being completely in the present with whatever sensation is arising. And in Buddhist meditation, we call this the field of arising. So that arising experience happening simultaneously with the suspension, with the break, with the projection of our consciousness going out into the future. The other thing that happens is that we're often thrown into what we think of as the past. Now, what is the past? Because we've learned from many different scriptural contexts that people will say there is no past, that the past is basically a figment of our imagination and that the past is highly subjective. Now, how does that jive with the understanding that there is a collective history of, of a country, of our lives? We know that there have been specific events that have taken place. So how do we put together the understanding that the past is completely subjective and maybe in some sense doesn't even exist because it has, in a sense, folded back or evaporated into that transcendental field underneath time. How do we reconcile this? How do we make the past viable? How do we know that we even have had a past? Well, again, our nervous system is constantly collecting information and the subtle value of that information is stored in what we call the chakra system or the energy system. And as I've mentioned many times in previous courses and as many other people have shared, the chakra system is a database. But what does the chakra system do with the database of the past? And why does it even need the past? Why should we need to know what happened to us even 30 seconds before or five years before? What difference does any of that make in looking now in this absolute moment of the present? Why should it make any difference to us? When the registration of events happen internally and also externally, all of those events collect and they form something that you could think of as a temporal envelope. It's a containment field of feeling and sequences of action that are folded together like a sandwich in layers. And in a sense, that is what our past is. Our past, subjectively, are many, many layers of feeling and thinking and events that have happened to us, all wedged together, layered together in a cake, if you will. And we taste that cake in the present. We have little flavors of the past flowing into us that inform our present. And I would say also inform our future too. 
So how do, do the past and the present, how do they marry together? How do they interact with one another? What happens? And why would that be important? When we have some memory of the past, those flavors that move into the present inform us of some possible expectation of feeling. Now, I get to see this illustrated quite a bit because, as some of you know, I've been spending a lot of time in assisted living facilities. And I need people who have Alzheimer's or dementia quite a bit. So I need people who have some type of memory impairment. You can have a whole dinner with one of those people. You can have a very amazing, incredible conversation. Or one night I actually played a concert, a whole concert for someone who has Alzheimer's. And the person really took in the information. There was a lot of interaction. And the next day, the person couldn't remember anything, not one blessed thing of what had occurred. So why is that important or not important? Well, on the one hand, when you don't have any memory of the past informing you, you're constantly folding into the present, folding into the present. And you still have the anticipatory future like we were talking about. So you're projecting, you know, maybe I'll go to the movies. Maybe I'll have dinner with friends tomorrow. But when there is no past informing you, there are certain kinds of feelings that get blunted and you can't remember what they're supposed to feel like. And that's what people who have these kinds of memory impairments will tell you, that they're having trouble remembering their first kiss. They, they don't remember their daughter or their son. They don't remember giving birth. They don't remember very key moments of feeling or understanding. So there's a sense of sorrow associated with that and a sense of loss associated with that. So somehow our subjective past is feeding information to us that enriches our present. And when our present is enriched by the past, we can flow out into the future. And when the future comes back to us and we are enriched by the past, we have more of a capacity to be comfortable in our own skin and to really recognize the beauty and power and uh, grace of life. So losing our connection to the past can be really difficult. But the other thing about the past is that because it's subjective, your sibling may have a completely different notion of your childhood than you have. Because the past is really not something that is entirely fixed by activities that are external. The past accumulates through our feeling level sensory experience. So when a time break occurs in the past, for example, you're on that bicycle and then somebody interrupts your bicycle ride. Maybe they walk in front of you or they jump out of the bushes or a car comes at you. There's a moment perhaps of panic or fear that might arise. And then, as we were saying, time will slow down and you will feel a sense of everything slowing down so you can assimilate this event that has occurred. So in the past, we have many, many, many experiences of this, where something will be happening, something will be interrupted, an expectation will not be realized, there will be some disappointment that some kind of fear might have been evoked, or, or we might have an experience in the past where we're sitting at the ocean and we've been there for 10 minutes, but we feel like we've been there for five days. Or we might be in some very, very pleasant situation with a new baby, or 
with a lover or some situation that evokes pleasure. And then the past will have that experience of elongation that we're talking about. So the compressed value, the suspended value, the elongated value, they're all living in the past with us. And those memories are imprinted with those understandings. And they follow us into the present, and then they're projected out to the future, and then they're held in the future in a kind of abeyance. In other words, there's a feeling of suspension in the future. When you go out into the future and you have the feeling of traveling in time, which I've had a lot of these experiences, when you move out into the future and you meet a person or situation, even if it's very simple or it can be very complex situation, like you're out in the future and you see a whole valley and there's an entire civilization in the valley, or you're out in the future and there are different types of transportation that you've never seen before, or you're out in the future and there are buildings that you just can't have right now because we don't have the technology to create them. When you're out in the future and you're seeing things that you have never seen before, there's that element of surprise and that sensation of surprise is built into the future and it travels back into the present. And I would even say that that element of surprise travels back into the past so that that feeling of surprise moves back through the present into the past and loops back into the future and comes back at you kind of like a boomerang or a time loop where you are experiencing something emotionally that's actually happening in the future. And because something in the present is triggering a future memory, you have a sensation in your body. And even though you may be saying to yourself as you listen to this, I don't have experiences of a visionary future. I don't see buildings in the future, or I don't see different forms of transportation in the future. But I would argue with you a bit about that. Because if you've ever been on an airplane and you're up in the air and you know you're going, say, 500 miles an hour, right? Have you ever noticed that when you get into the airplane and the airplane is taking off and you're about to go up and you have a sensation of climbing in the airplane, there will be a feeling in each, inside of a change in time. And usually that change in time is a form of expansion. You'll feel that time is elongating or it's suspending as we're talking about in this talk. And the reason for that is because you're actually going at a pretty high speed. And even though you can't feel yourself at 500 miles an hour, and that's a good thing because it would be way too overwhelming for your nervous system, but your body-mind complex knows that you're traveling quickly and you're also at, you know, climbing in altitude. So when you go out into the future, you're actually traveling very, very quickly. And this is why you can go out into the future. Because when you're going out, let's say it's 50 years or 100 years or 1,000 years, the mechanics of your central nervous system that register time and are sensitive to the temporal field will actually create it so that even though this is a very big distance in time, it will not feel distant to you. You will feel that you're in the present future. In other words, when you experience the future, it's living inside your present. And you can actually walk around in that future building. You can look at the walls. You can look at the lighting. You can see artwork on the walls. 
You can walk out into the future and see the way trees might look or how a river might look because your nervous system is taking that information and it's interpreting back into your present. And it's also correlating with memories that you have had from the past. So your emotional and sequential memories that are in the past are talking to you in the present, informing your present, allowing you to have the confidence, the poise, and the willingness to go out into the future to look at the future, to see what is happening there, and bring back information into the present. This sets up a different carriage, a different sense of poise in your body, in your mind, in your spirit. And it can also guard against dispiritedness, depression, uh, sadness, a lack of enthusiasm, apathy, when we're disconnected from the capacity of the nervous system to move out into a visionary future and to see the possibilities that are available to us, we feel imprisoned in the present. And therefore, this sense that only the present is viable, only the present is important, only works if the present has been impacted fully by the past and the future. So the present takes on a kind of density. It becomes thick with feeling and meaning and significance. And one of the purposes of the temporal field is to increase the experience of significance, which leads also to an experience of increased synchronicity where we see an event structure or a theme and it recapitulates itself very rapidly in our inner life and this increases that experience of significance why is significance important because when the temporal field is talking to us which it does and it's telling us about our life it wants to help us understand that as an individual, we are entirely unique. We are entirely special and we are entirely beloved. The temporal field is informed by the pure love value in the universal intelligence. So the temporal field wants to teach us about being loved. And how does it do that? Through showing us event sequences that reveal significance to us, that reveal meaning to us, that give us a sense of I am and give us a feeling of importance outside of the framework of the ego. This level of importance that we're talking about now is a sense of highly significant life meaning that comes when the integration of the past, present, and future merge together into a fully viable present that is informed on both ends. So the information highways are all opened up between our past, between our subjective past and our sequential past, our collective past and our personal subjective future, our collective future, and all of those memories, all of those feelings, all of those recapitulating experiences merge together and create a feeling of viability, enthusiasm, and meaning. So to get through a period like we are in now, we, where we have experienced a very profound, radical temporal shift, it's very important to understand that we need to hold on to the feeling of significance and meaning. Because if things become meaningless 
and we don't feel that there is any importance to our own individuated life, we are going to lose touch with the information that the temporal field is, fi is filing within us and generating within us to teach us something about what this shift actually means. We can't have a premonition. We can't have an awakening to meaning if apathy and a sense of inertia has set in because that movement in time will become too slow and we will not be able to go out into the quickness of the future to see what could be brought back to us where solutions actually lie. So I'd like to stop there for a moment and open up to any questions or thoughts that anybody would like to share. Here's the, uh, you can ask them to unmute if they want to ask a question or they can also. Uh, so we'd like yeah. to ask you to unmute or you can chat with us and Doug will, is at the computer and will share your chat information with us. I'm not hearing anything yet. I have a comment. Yeah, thank you. Hi, it's Penny. You had touched on something that has become very obvious to me. You touched on uh, technology today, uh, that we're being given so much information at once. And I think in the context of what you're talking about, it's causing us to not be able to deal with time because when we see conflict going on in what we call real time, or we're being given all of this information and we're trying to di dissect or make sense of all this information that's being thrown at us, it takes time to digest it. Time in the sense of our personally being able to understand the information that's being thrown to us and make sense of it within the framework of our understanding on an individual basis. And I think in this context of talking about time, it's becoming, I think, a problem for people to be able to rationally think about what's actually going on in the world because we're hearing such conflicting information and there's no time to digest it, no t fake news, what you were talking about. We don't know what's real and what's not real. And I'm not aware of ever feeling that way about living in society. It's an interesting phenomenon. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that that's a really important observation. And it's partially, I think, a function of time speeding up. So we're in a training program right now where there, where there is a tremendous amount of information being thrown at us, as you're saying, Penny. And it's, it, it is almost overwhelming at times. I think all of us would probably agree that that is true. I would say to you, though, that in my experience of going out into the future and being with people, my experience is that those people are living about a hundred times uh, more quickly and with many hundred times more information than we are assimilating right now. And that's why when I go out in the future, it's very, very overwhelming usually. It's kind of like going to a very crowded restaurant and you hear all that background noise and you're trying to have a private conversation with your friend. There's so much information that's being processed at such a rapid rate 
And that is my experience of going out into the future. Whereas when you travel back into the past, it's kind of the opposite of that. And just think about that in your own memory. Like I'm going to be 65 years old this year. When I go back and think about the 50s and how slow it was and and just my elementary school and the children there and the conversations that we would have and and really the way everything felt much slower much more time if you will much more elongation of time so it appears that the higher intelligence mechanisms in the future are needing to train us how to assimilate this tremendous amount of information, whether it's emotional, political, social, digital, all of it is coming at us, just like you said. However, the reason that I believe this is happening is because it's going to force us to go into that non-referential time state, which underlies all the activity, like we're discussing. It's going to force us to enter into that state because we can't possibly take in on all the information. It's just like if you're on a very fast train, like have you ever been to Europe and they have very, very fast trains there and they're, they're going really like a bullet. There's so much information passing out through the window that you couldn't possibly take it in. So what happens is something inside releases, lets go, and slows down. So in order to really talk to people who are in the future, if you will, future sentient beings, we have the experience of slowing down internally and entering and diving into that state that is underneath the sequence of events. This causes changes in breathing, in respiration, in the heart, in the brain, that make it possible to actually interpret what is actually being fed to us excuse me, even if it's information that we normally would never understand because it's too technical, uh, it's too powerful, it may not make sense to us, we have nothing to compare it to. So I feel that we're kind of in a training program about that. Just my thought. Anything else that anybody want to share? Okay, so if there aren't any other comments or questions, uh, I'm going to lead a brief meditation now. So if everybody would just kindly relax, I'm going to take off the headset, hand it back to Doug so that I can do this. And I'd like to ask you to close your eyes and just relax into your body. And as you relax into your body, I'd like you to go inside and look for that underlying quiet field that is always in existence in your awareness. It's always there. And I would like you to observe some of the events that have happened to you today. Go back in your day and look at some of the visual memories that have occurred, whatever they may be, and just let them move like a movie in front of you while simultaneously you're relaxing underneath those event sequences. So you're inside, you're relaxing, you're allowing time to suspend itself, 
And as you're allowing times to suspend itself, you're being able to see the day. And I, I want to invite you not only to see things visually, to look at the colors, the shapes, but to hear conversation, to remember little things that maybe you had forgotten about the day, small interactions that you've had with one individual person. I would like you to remember periods of waiting, periods where you may have felt impatient, periods where you may have felt a sense of expectation or a feeling even of being startled by something that you did not think was going to happen. Let yourself bring the memories of the day, which are our past, into the present so that you are making contact with them. And as you allow those memories to come forward, then I would also like to ask you to simultaneously send projective consciousness out into the future. So now it's tomorrow and there are events that are emerging from your consciousness from tomorrow and they are coming back to you. There are lights, there are sounds, there are buildings, there are people. And I want you to look at the details of what the future is sending back to you. Little small things that maybe you would normally never remember. You're looking at little details in the environment, in nature, interactions that you're observing in the future that have not occurred yet, but you're seeing them and you're assimilating those actions and those feelings and you're bringing packages of information back from the future into your present. And I would like you to continue to have the memories of the day, which are your past. Allow them to continue to reveal themselves to you while you are simultaneously moving your consciousness into the future. So you're going out into the future. You're allowing everything to fall back into the present. Then you're going back into your past and maybe even a little further back into your past to a few days ago or a week ago or a month ago. And memories are flooding into your present. And then you're in the present and then you're going out into the future and little details and now maybe some larger, larger images of the future more panoramic images, more expansive images of the future are feeding their information back into the present. And as this circulation, this loop of time occurs where you're moving from the present into the past, towards the future, arcing back into the present, moving into the past like that, you're feeling the circularity of time, this multiphasic time experience manifesting in your awareness. Then I would like you to ask yourself a question. Is there anything that you're experiencing from the past, the present, or the future that is sharing something of its significance with you? Is there some meaning is there some resonance between the present, the past, and the future? And as it circulates back to you, are you experiencing some meaning, some significance, some insight, 
into your life. And as that insight begins to arise in you, notice any sensations in your body that the insight is producing. Any feelings in your body that the insight is producing. Continue to allow your consciousness to fall back into the past. Let it work its way into the future. And again, little events, very small circumstances, a car passing in front of you, a small conversation, something that is anomalous in nature or that takes your attention, that is pleasant or that is unusual. You're bringing that information back into the present and there's a feeling of suspension that is building in the present where time feels suspended, where time feels elongated, where time feels impregnant, impregnated with the past and the future simultaneously. And the present is becoming more dense, more full, more significant, more real. And for this moment, you're feeling the reality of time in the present entertaining the future, informing itself with the past, intermingling all of these values together and creating a feeling of significance, of poise, and a feeling of faith. A feeling of faith. A feeling that everything is right, that everything is good, that there's an experience of truth, of justice, and of light. And as that light fills your consciousness in the present, and you're interacting with that light, allow that light to bathe every cell of your body in its own healing intelligence and essence. Allow that to penetrate your cells and penetrate your nervous system, and penetrate your being. And now, coming into that state, let yourself experience this deep, non-referenced experience of time. It is not oriented past or present. It's not even oriented into the future. It's just held in a feeling level understanding of the nature of reality and a feeling of poise in that reality, of confidence in that reality and stability in that reality. Let yourself feel that stabilization in your awareness, in your consciousness, and then taking in that stability very gradually come back into the room that you're sitting in. Notice little details in the room. Notice any colors in the room. And just let yourself take in the environment around you, having been informed by a loop of time that you have engendered during this experience. And just let all of that settle, all of the words that have been spoken, and just relax into this experience for just a moment, being in that silence, being in that silence, and allowing it just to wash over you with a feeling of peace. That that feeling of peace wash over you very tenderly with a great feeling of love. 
and enjoying that feeling, enjoying that tenderness. This is the place where we will close for this evening. Thank you very much. And we invite you to come to our next webinar. And if you could kindly send us your email address, if we don't have that, we would very much appreciate that because we are looking, as you know, to create a longer course on the subject of time and space and consciousness. Thank you again and have a good evening.